Hi, my name is Joe Guadagno. I am what we call Director of Technology Quicken Loans, America's largest mortgage uh, broker. I am here to talk to you about how you can help your application scale with Microsoft Azure. A little bit about me, you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, my webpage where I stream usually three times a week. I'll probably stream after this episode at jjg.me slash stream. So we're here to talk about Azure. Uh, I'll pull up the slides at the end for the contact information if you need. Uh, we're going to walk through a couple of different pieces of Azure. We're going to start off with a basic Everyone call it Hello World app because it's a little bit more than that. It's a contact application that has a API to it, a front end using MVC, as well as a database component. So we're going to start off by publishing this web app and the API to Windows Azure. We're then going to go and update to it to be hosted on Azure. Then we are going to create what's called the blob storage container that will allow us to hold our images within the application. It's basically a contact application. You can add first name, last name, uh, date of birth, that kind of stuff. And we store our images right now locally, but we'll end up storing them in Azure to allow us the ability to kind of grow with without running out of disk space in theory. And then we probably won't have any time, but if we do, we'll dive into hosting those images on a content delivery network, and then maybe look at application insights. So that's about all I have for the slides right now. So I'm going to stop that. We'll minimize that. We'll go take a look at the code. So you notice first thing that's slightly different is I am using JetBrains Rider. Let's go and change the screen resolution a little bit so that it's not super tiny on your screens. Uh, let's go here and fonts and change the size. Normally I would have done this beforehand, but I totally forgot. So let's do that. Good news is we're not gonna spend a lot of time in Writer. This is just to kind of give you a walkthrough of the app. So let's start off with running the API and the web app. And then let's start it off on a different screen. Let me pull that in. So here we have the web API. You call the contacts endpoint and it returns you a JSON list of all your contacts. So let's go and change that a little bit and go to the web UI just to show you what that looks like. And then we're gonna go walking through the promotion. So here we have a simple ASP MVC app. There's a homepage, which you see here, privacy links. If we click contact, you have the ability to see contacts. I can click on any contact to see them. See a nice little image of me. I can click edit and see more details of me and there. And we're going to have the ability to upload images. Ignore the URL for now. That's just me hosting it locally. So that's it for the app for now. So first thing we're going to do is go over to Azure and we're going to start creating a couple of resources. Typically, before I create resources, I prefer to create a resource group with it. So I'm going to go to resource group, hit create. And what resource groups allows you to do is to have a, have a kind of grouping of all your resources together. I know I use the same words in the description, but just think of it is uh, this is one big gigantic container that I can throw everything in. And this allows for easier maintenance later on, especially if you're hosting a couple of different items in here, which we're gonna do. 
uh, it allows you to see them all together. If I was to show you my current Azure subscription, you'd probably see that there are, I don't know, like 50, 60 some odd can, different things that are sitting there. So without the grouping of them, it makes it a little challenging. So you can assign resource groups to regions. You want the regions to be close to wherever you are. In this case, since the closest region to me is West US 2, that's where I'm putting it. I click Review and Create. Validation passes. Uh, you'll see that for each individual resource we create. Once it's done, I'm going to click Go to Resource Group, and then we're going to go and add a couple of resources. First set of resources we're going to add is what's called an app service plan. So I'm going to click new and then search for app service. And search for app service plan and then create what app service plan is, is essentially a uh, series of web servers for your in this case, resource groups. So we're going to host our different web apps on web servers using the app service plan here. And I'm going to give it a unique name. In this case, I am going to, everything I'm prefixing here is with the LAA, which just stands for Lap Around Azure. I kind of do that to organize a lot of my resources together, even though they're inside of groups. In case we don't see them in groups, I know which service is which. You notice there's a little check mark here, meaning that I met the requirements for it being a unique name. I'm going to choose the operating system. You can choose Windows or Linux since I'm running .NET Core and some other things. It's just easier for me to choose Linux or sorry, Windows, but you can choose whatever you want. And then I'm going to choose US West 2 because that's where everything is going to be together. I kind of wish it really defaulted to that based on the resource group. And then the pricing tier, this is kind of the type of servers you want. I'm going to click change size just so we can see. Now, typically when I'm doing these demos, I would pick a D1 because this is just for for local development for us. Uh, and it gives you a rough, a rough cost of it. However, these are shared infrastructures, as it says. And when I'm doing a demo or something like this, you could get kind of limited or rate limited with things. So for the demo, I'm just going to choose a standard image, which the cheapest they have is $73 and it comes with a bunch of features. Again, these are prices in US dollars. We're not going to cover most of these features in this. We're going to kind of do a quick walkthrough. Click apply and then first thing we do is review and create. Kind of gives us an overview of everything we're doing. Click on create. And then the deployment is in process. This is essentially VMs for us somewhere in the US West to data center data center. Once this is done, we'll get the deployment is complete. Go to resource. And then we're going to see a bunch of different options here. We're going to come back to some of these later on. But you see right now what our CPU is, memory percentage, data in, data out is. We haven't done anything yet, so this is going to be pretty small. Click on apps and there's no apps hosted in here yet. So there's not really much for us to see. So let's go back to overview and click on home and then we're going to create a new resource. Now we're going to create our web app. So web apps, think of these as IAS applications that allow you to store things like Node.js apps, Java, Ruby, .NET Core, ASP.NET. We're going to create two of them, one for our API and then one for our MVC app. So I'm going to click Create. Let's pick that resource group. Let's give it a name. As you can tell, I've run through this demo once or twice, so 
uh, Microsoft Edge is filling in the blanks for me. You have the ability to choose code or Docker container. Right now, I'm going to choose code. I don't want to introduce Docker to this. I'm going to choose the runtime of ASP.NET Core 3.1, but you can choose whatever is applicable for your application. And then here it says, not finding your app service plan, try a different region. I don't know why it defaults to Central US when the region for the um, resource group is in West US 2, but once I choose West US 2, you'll notice here it found at least one resource. If I scroll through, it's going to show the other resources and the size that it's doing. If you wanted to, you could have created a new one right here, which would have taken us through the same steps, but I wanted to show each step individually. Let's click create. It's going to create that resource. And we're going to go to want to, I'm going to open up a new image because we're going to swap back and forth between these two. And we can probably close this off. I'm going to create another resource now. And this is going to be a web app. Now you notice right now we're creating two different web applications for it and they're hosted on this one server so it makes it uh, we're not increasing costs by running more than one of them at a time and this one we are going to call this one law-web app and do the same thing code dinet 31 pick west us 2 and then pick the server for it click review and create click review and create now that's creating let's make sure the other one is done the other one is done so we're just going to click go to resource for now and then we're going to open up a third one and the only reason why we're opening up these is just because it makes it a little bit easier to swap back and forth because we're going to be coming back and forth to the api the web app and this new page that's still deploying so now we're going to create our sql server instance for this one we're going to create a azure sql resource now this creation looks a little bit differently because there are three different types that you can choose from depending on your flavor. The differences are this one here, SQL databases. This is a managed connection. This allows you to, or this has Microsoft manage everything for you and essentially just creates the database for you and allows you to interact with it. Managed instances are very similar, but it's a full-fledged install of SQL. This you're using SQL as a service. This you're using their hosted version. And this is a virtual machine, meaning you have the full control over the operating system, patches, and everything. For our case, we're going to just create a simple single database. Let's choose our region. Let's give it a database name. We're going to call it contacts. And then a new server. We don't have a server for this, so I'm going to create a new server and then give it a name. So here we're going to do, uh, let's see what I call law-sql server. give it a username and then I'm going to copy a password over from another screen. It really doesn't matter because I'm just going to delete these instances afterwards, but it just makes things tad easier. So let's go for US West 2. Click OK.
Now you notice here you have the ability to choose the type. I recommend strongly that you take a look at it because I think the default database is something like $700 US a month. Oh, first. Uh, which I could in theory run for this since I'm going to destroy the instance right after it's done. But uh, I'm going to choose standard for this and just use the out of the box defaults. And honestly, for most applications, uh, this is pretty simple, especially for our contact application. And there's a cost of $10 a month. If you want, you can drop this down to, I think, uh, one gig there is a way that you can get it oh if you go to basic you can drop it down even more to like five dollars a month and not just use this uh, five dtus which is usually enough or at least for everything that i've seen so far now we're done we're going to click review it's going to kind of give us an overview of everything that we've done and click create and that should give us the database now the database takes a little bit longer to create i mean everything else was done in a couple of seconds this takes anywhere from a minute to three minutes depending on whether or not uh i please the uh demo beings right now so i am going to switch over to our uh, development environment for us to be able to kind of interact with the database. So let's go with our here. Now, normally you can open up SQL Server, um, SQL Server Studio or Azure Data Studio or something like Visual Studio with the integration or Writer has data grid. There are so many tools to connect to your databases nowadays. I like to keep everything inside of one if I can. So luckily, Writer has the ability to do that for me. And I can do it one of two ways. Hit new data source and then choose Azure SQL database here. Or I can actually use their Azure Explorer and do it now. So I'm going to do it this way just to show uh, some of the commands. So it's going to want to know the server name. So let's go back to our web page and grab the server name. It should be done by now. Almost done. And it should really be lost. Oh, it's done. Look at that. So I'm going to go to resource and we're going to keep this tab open. So let's copy this out, which is our server name. Go back here, and it's going to want to know, want to know the, the user ID, ID which, is which is that, and copy the word. No one look at a bunch of dots in the password field, and paste that. And then I'm going to want to choose the contacts database. There's a limitation with the. Uh, drivers that's used here. It doesn't allow you to go switch between master and uh, contacts relatively easily or basically switch between databases on the same server. I'm going to click test connection and make sure things are good. And you'll notice here that I got a message that might be hard to see, but it says the specified database user password is rejected. Then the message says cannot open server server requested by login client with ip address 72 blah 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 is not allowed to access server to enable go to azure to fix it if i do this through the azure explorer it allows me to automatically add it if you do it through the azure uh, Data Studio, it also allows you to do that, but I did it through here on purpose to show you how to make those changes on the portal. So as soon as you go back to the SQL Server database portion, there is a item here called Set Server Firewall. So I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna actually zoom in a little bit just so 
you can see a little bit better. There's a button here called add client IP, which is what I'm going to do. It throws a rule here that says client IP address when it was added, the start and end. Depending on your organization, you would add a set of IP ranges and that's your public facing IP address. This is my public facing IP address. So what I like to do is just name the role for it is. So here we're going to create a local role for this IP address, which is mine. This allows only this only requests coming from this IP range access to the servers. Now, typically you would click save, but in order to save a step later on, there is one other option I want to do. So there's a setting here, allow Azure services and resources to access this server. I'm going to click yes here. This ability later on when we have our API to have it call Azure, Azure have it call this database. By default, it is locked down and only allowed uh, to access what you configure. So let's click save here. Uh, it's successful. I'm going to click OK. Let's go back to writer. Uh, click OK to try it again. Oh, I probably need to give it the password. It only saves the password once there's a successful login. Let's try again. Hey, what are you doing? So when this happens, I tend to kill it and come back and react. So let's get our server name right. Oh, wrong window. I did hit save. It has my AP address. So let's go back to the database, get the server name, and then let's paste you in here. Oh, I didn't put the right server name in there. And then pick my username, let's copy out the password, and contacts. This is one of the reasons why you tend to uh, script out using something like Terraform or Azure Resource uh, Manager to script out your resources. I'm showing this more of how you actually do it so you know if what happens when things break. So now we got a little check mark. It was successful. I click OK and it's going to go through and see I have nothing here. So the first thing we're going to do now is go and copy off or basically create our database. So for that, I am going to pop off to a different screen to load some SQL scripts. Now, normally you would back make a backup of your database and then restore it here. So in this case, I am just going to run them all. Let's choose the contacts database. Control all. Play. All the database tables were created. Now we are going to create our users. Ignore the password. Like I said, these resources are going to get destroyed right after this. So it doesn't really matter that you see my password is password one. And there's really nothing in here anyway. A SQL login for our application called contacts user. And now we're going to give that user the permission to access the database, which it's good. And now last thing for us to do is create some seed data. Again, this would be if you backed up your application 
or backed up your database and transport it here. But since this is just a demo, I'm creating everything manually. So now I create it. So now we have Azure data, if I go here, I can do a select star from contacts. And I should have, I think, four items or five items here. Myself, Brady, Jane Doe, and Brian. So we're good to go. Now we need to send off our applications up from locally, or at least the source, to Azure. So let's go to our API first. And with our API, we are going to publish it. So depending on what tools you're using, you can use FTP deployment. You can use Azure deployment if you're using Visual Studio. There's a right-click publish. In most cases, you do not ever, ever, ever want to right-click publish. Because of time, we're going to do it right from the IDE, but ideally you'd be using something like Octopus Deploy, GitHub Actions, Azure DevOps pushes, but here I'm showing you how you can do it from your IDE. So in this case, I'm going to choose right-click, publish, and then publish to Azure. And this gives me the ability to write the IDE to publish it, give it any name I want. And then you have the app configuration database saying use existing app. It's going to look at my current Azure credentials and see what apps by default, it doesn't load any, that's for performance. Click refresh. And it should show me did I log out of my Azure account? Yeah, I logged out of my Azure account. Give me a second. I have to re-sign back in. I have to grab my phone. Oh, maybe not. I just needed to refresh it. So now if I go back to the Azure Explorer, I should be able to publish, publish to Azure. And now it's loading them all. This will take a second or two. It's essentially behind the scenes running their API calls. And as you can see, I have quite a few of these. We're going to want the LAA-API app for this. I could choose open in browser after publish, which will launch the URL for this. I don't want to do that right now because there's some configuration that we need to do on the server side. So let's click run. What's happening behind the scenes now is it is building the application, which it just did. Now it's creating a zip file. It's going to update the zip file. Typically this takes 10 to 40 seconds, depending on your internet connection. It usually does it in the first attempt, although lately it's been doing it on two attempts. And now it's done. And I can click on this link to see it. We're gonna do the same thing with the web. And then that's gonna be pretty much it for the IDE work right now. Let's choose publish. Excuse me, published Azure, and let's choose the La web app. Click run. Now, if I ever want to republish those things from here, I can just choose these publish shortcuts up top where I would normally run the app. Once they're done, we're going to want to migrate the uh, settings for the application. This one is done. So let's just take a quick look at the API settings. This one only really has one setting that we need to migrate the contacts database SQL server. So let's just copy that text, go back to Azure and let's go to the API. So way down here, we have a configuration setting. 
This allows you to manage your application configuration. If you're using web, think of this as your web.config. If you're using the uh, classic version of the framework, if you're using .NET Core, think of this as your app settings. Uh, you can also use app settings, but this allows the portal administrator to be able to overwrite things and not developers, which is what you typically would want because this would have, you know, these sensitive connection strings. So here, I'm going to enter that. Now for the value, uh, it's going to want the connection string that you would uh, set for your SQL Server. So let's go to the SQL Server. There's a connection strings tab here. You can click show, copy and paste this text and put it in there. However, mine is slightly different because I don't want people connecting with my administrator account. We wanna connect with the user, with the contact user we created. So I am going to paste in that as you can just see the only real difference is we're using the user id of contacts user and the password so I click ok click save click continue that's going to require a restart of the server as you see here successfully updated app settings now i'm going to launch the site and if i got everything correctly I should be able to navigate to it. So let's open you up in a new URL. And that's fine because we don't have anything at the base of it. But we have under contacts. If I got this right, we should see the same JSON that we got before. So now this is all hosted in Azure, as you can tell here from our URL live API, Azure websites.net slash contact. So now we need to configure the web app. The web app takes a little bit more work because it needs some more settings. So let's go and do that. Need to add a new application setting. And let's do settings.api URL. Good thing is I've done this demo a couple of times, so a lot of the settings are already there. Now you don't have to uh, copy and paste too much, although I will be going off screen. So this one just tells us where we're getting the root of our API from. This allows us to do local development, non-local development. And then we want, this is for the blob storage. We're gonna leave this one blank for now because we need to create the containers, which we haven't. Another app setting, this is for the name of the container. And this is where our images are going to be stored. And then the last is the URL for us to return this is essentially the container url that allows us to have access to the images so we should have four settings here that allow our application to run i'm going to click save continue and if i run the application now you'll see we'll be able to get to one piece of it. So I'm going to click overview, open you up in a new tab. It should load fine. Let's put you over here. If I click this contacts, we're going to get an error because when we click contacts, we try to access the blob storage container, which we don't have. So let's go and create one of them too now. So I think we're done with the SQL. So I'm going to go away from that. Click new, type storage account. Now blob storage allows you to create and uh, do a couple of different things. So storage account allows you to store things called blobs, which are essentially just gigantic files. Uh, you can use Azure files, Azure queues, and or tables. We're gonna use the blob storage, which just allows us to throw a bunch of images in there. 
And it's a really cost-effective way to store images. Can only contain lowercase numbers, must have between. Oh, you can't do dash with this. So we're going to create it. Law storage, West US 2. Standard or premium for this, you want standard. But if you click here, you can see the difference. Standard is essentially what you'd want for most. If you're hosting a high performance e commerce site, you probably want premium. We're going to use the second generation of storage. And then for replication, we want locally redundant. Hot or cold, hot means more instant on, cold or cool is used for like backups. Click review and create. And then click create. This takes about 10 seconds or so for it to create in the background. Once it's done creating, we are going to go to it and create what's called a container. Container you can think of as like a file folder on your operating system. It allows you a place to just throw stuff into. And they say it's object storage, and it really is. You can put anything in there, files, uh, data, images, whatever you want. So you see the four basic options, containers, file shares, tables, queues, file shares allow you to do something like a cloud drive or a uh, Dropbox kind of thing. Uh, tables allows you to do non-relational database. Think of it as document DB, it's essentially a key value store and queues is uh, simple queuing. So we're gonna go to containers. And then once this loads, create a new container. Uh, once this loads, we're going to create a new container. Here it goes. Click new. And then not give it my wife's name. She wouldn't be happy if that was the name of it. And this name should match the name that we put in the configuration file. You have three different options. Typically, you would want private and then control it using your uh, integrated access manager within Azure to control permissions. We're going to do blob anonymous read only, only because we want to just have our images served in a read only mode from the browser. So I'm going to click create. Now we have our images here. Now, typically, this is something you'd want to do off screen. Now that we have the connection here, we want to be able to get access to it. Uh, because we don't have enough time to kind of cover how you can do it with the access control IAM, we're going to use the older method called access keys. So normally, I would pull this off screen because you don't want anyone to see what the access keys are. So I'll be really quick about it. And again, I'm going to delete these resources afterwards. So if someone wants to use it right now to upload a bunch of images, so be it. Uh, now we're going to go here and we have to tell our application what the storage account name was. So that's this setting here. I am going to hit edit, paste it in there. Click OK, save, continue. Now, if everything is working correctly, when I when this is restarted, which it is, I should be able to refresh the application. Hit contacts, contacts should load. And then we're going to upload an image. And let's choose browse and let's see what image am I going to pick? Let's do my DevReach Podium pick. Click upload. And there's the gigantic image of me with my cool laptop at DevReach in Bulgaria. And that's 
it for the Azure vacation. Let's double check it's not all smoke and mirrors. So I'm going to go back to writer and show us that it's there. So let's go to storage account and then look for that storage account, which is lost storage. There's the new contacts image I created. There is the new image 21.jpg. 21, in case you didn't notice, was the ID right here. And it was created at 1.40 a.m., which was one minute ago my time. So I'm going to download this to see if the image was what we wanted. Click downloads, click OK. Open this up, and now we see we just downloaded one at 141. Open it up. There's the image of me. So now we have a fully hosted application in Azure in under 40 minutes. That is all I have for you with three minutes to spare. Get my contact information up on the screen again if you want to reach out to me. Feel free to contact me on Twitter on Facebook at josephwadagno.net, LinkedIn, Joseph Wadagno, my webpage, or my stream. If you're seeing some of this content, I stream three times a week, typically Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, but I also have a YouTube channel with all the recorded videos. That's all I got, gentlemen. And there's a giant cat running across the screen. <laughs> if you're talking, I can't hear you. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, sorry, that was my bad. I can't hear you. Guys. Uh, thank you, Joseph, for. Hello, can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this awesome presentation. I understand it's uh, one one in the morning, two in the morning at your place. Yeah, thank you for the comment. One forty-three. One forty-three. <laughs> That was that was an awesome presentation. Uh, anybody who has questions, you can uh, just ask it uh, in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, I was wondering on behalf of the students, is Azure offering uh, free resources for students? Yes. Uh, there is... Let's kill the PowerPoint slide for a second. There it is. If you go, you go to. to uh, there's a special URL for students. I think if you go here to azure.microsoft.com, there is under support or partners. There is a way to do it. Where did you go? Pricing, pricing. Here's a student. There are over. 45 different resources that you can get for free on it. Uh, where's the student one? I know there is a separate student pricing. You get essentially, I think it's $100 US a month for free. If you have a Visual Studio license, here it is, student developer resources. So azure.microsoft.developer.students. And then there's a start free and talks to you about, you know, what you get out of it. Okay. Yeah, that's that's good for Azure to have. So here you go. If there's any student watching, you can uh, start uh, developing and maintaining, uh, developing your, your apps and using Azure. Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen. It was a pleasure. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. See you. Ciao. See ya.